Dot, who is, button, who is Associate Professor of Neurology at the University of Southern California. Dr. John Schott is part of USC's Neuroimaging and Informatics Institute, where she studies the genetic influences on brain structure using high resolution structural imaging. So Dr. John Schott received her bachelor's degree in biomedical and electrical engineering in 2006, and her PhD in biomedical engineering at UCLA in 2012. She has just an impressive number of publications in high impact journals, including Molecular Psychiatry and Nature, which really speaks to the groundbreaking work that she's involved in, which we will hear about today. And so the multidisciplinary work that Nada has been involved in has really revolutionized how we conduct imaging research from databases such as ADNI to study Alzheimer's disease to the Human Connectome Project that aims to map the living brain's major pathways and functions. Um, and so I first got to know about some of Netta's work as we're both members of the Enigma Consortium and have co-authored at least two papers together on the brain structure and PTSD. Um, and so as a part of this international group, Netta develops protocols for large-scale meta-analyses of brain structure and connectivity. And also as a side note, not only is Netta a rock star in the Enigma community, but she was also profiled by LA Weekly in its annual celebration of the most fascinating people in Los Angeles. So without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. John Shah. Thank you very much, Jasmine. I don't even know where you dug up all that information. But, uh, I have yeah. sources. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'm just being asked to confirm the recording. Um, so, so thanks so much for having me. It's it's great to be here, um, even virtually, as part of your uh, uh, Center for Cognitive and uh, Behavioral Brain Imaging. Um, feel like I'm in Ohio right now, and so it's it's a little bit sunnier or warmer here. Um, but uh, but yeah, thanks thanks again for for the introduction. Um, my talk today will largely focus on the work that we we we've, we've been doing as part of the Enigma Consortium, and um, just going to give you a little bit of background of how it started, um, some of the the major uh, aims that that really got got the consortium going, a couple of the directions that we're headed now, and and um, by no means am I uh, really covering everything. Um, and then some of the future directions, some of the open questions that would really uh, help to have um, just a lot more uh, brains involvement. And I don't mean like uh, uh, data points, but uh, actually, um, you know, all of you helping uh, uh, doing research in the area, I think uh, would really help drive the field forward. So, um, uh, and, and feel free to, to interrupt if you have questions. Um, or, or if you want me to um, repeat something, or if I'm, you know, if, if something's boring to you, let me know and, <laughs> and I can skip it. Um, so um, I have some NIH funding and Biogen funding, um, but uh, nothing uh, Biogen is, is uh, being presented. Um, as, as many of you are, are probably well aware, we've been having this uh, replication crisis in really uh, all of biomedical research and uh, brain imaging studies have, are, are no exception. Um, so in recent years, they've been, there've been uh, several um, publications that really call out some of the, the failures in, in reproducibility of neuroscience research. Um, and this is, uh, this is a big problem because a lot of the the findings from uh, from from decades of research might not actually be um, reliable and, and useful for the for driving the field forward. So, uh, although neuroimaging is extremely powerful in terms of being able to uh, look into a, a living human brain non-invasively, um, it's it's it can be extremely expensive to do well-powered uh, studies. So a lot of times, um, historically, sample sizes for, for data collection have been approximately 20 to uh, 200 samples. Um, and they've been conducted with uh, 
at a single center without necessarily uh, an independent replication sample. Um, a lot of times uh, there wasn't a proper um, correction for multiple comparisons and, and therefore a lot of the results didn't hold when, when people tried to reproduce the findings. Um, and, and to top that off, a lot of times there's publication biases. You can't, it's hard to get a paper uh, published with, with negative uh, findings or no, null findings, I should say, or, or even if they're contradictory to, um, to other previous uh, publications. So this, there's been this inflation of effect sizes uh, even in uh, meta-analysis of the literature because of this publication bias. Um, so there have been certain or, or quite a number of, of uh, uh, initiatives that, that attempt to address the small sample size issue. Um, and these are uh, generally large consortia that have been um, uh, initiated to, to increase uh, sample size. Um, uh, a lot of the brain imaging is now done uh, across multiple uh, multiple sites and the data collection has been coordinated and uh, imaging um, uh, acquisition protocols harmonized and aimed to uh, be kept relatively consistent across all the different sites. So th all these resources have become uh, exceptional uh, uh, huge resources to really allow us to make a lot of scientific discoveries. Um, however, what about all the other data? What about all the data that we collected years ago? Uh, all the small sample sizes between two to 200, like how can we, can we still use all that? Um, so a lot of times we have investigators that are funded to study a lot of the same questions, uh, maybe at different institutes, different countries, such as uh, brain development, psychiatric disorders, um, aging and dementia. These might be in different populations and they might even be uh, with respect to uh, different particular variables or, or, or different tasks. Um, but regardless, I, given that the theme is the same, uh, maybe we're able to merge all the data to have uh, more powerful, reliable uh, findings without having to um, start a brand new uh, prospective multi-site um, cohort or initiative that could cost uh, uh, millions of dollars to initiate. So that's where um, really Enigma came from. So the Enigma Consortium uh, stands for uh, Enhancing Neuroimaging Genetics Through Meta-Analysis. Um, and I'll get to why that's sort of shifting a little bit towards the end of this talk. Um, so uh, Enigma is originally started um, to look for, as the name might uh, imply, look for uh, neuroimaging genetic studies uh, uh, or to specifically perform neuroimaging genetic studies. And you might ask, well, we've had neuroimaging genetic studies for, for decades, for over a decade. Um, we, we know certain polymorphisms and their risk for uh, altering um, different brain structure and function. But actually, if you go back, a lot of the papers um, that, that had done uh, imaging genetics prior to, let's say, um, 2010 or so, uh, had possibly weak statistical corrections, uh, didn't necessarily attempt to replicate the study, and were quite underpowered, actually. So if you do a power analysis, you need approximately 800 people to detect um, uh, an effect size of, uh, or, or an effect that explains 1% of the variance. Um, with 80% power at P less than um, just 0.05. So that's one SNP. Um, and so one particular genetic variant for many common traits explains less than 1% of the variance. So 800 is actually on the small side and that's just one trait, one SNP. Uh, and as I mentioned, a lot of the, the studies before were being done in less than 100 people. So if we go back 
to that same slide I showed before. Um, I've now highlighted some of the aspects that, that make you realize that these were underpowered uh, or not sufficiently statistically corrected. So um, just you know, 126 or 36 even, if you test five, if you have five tests, you, uh, 0.03 is, is not significant. Um, so, so the list goes on and Enigma actually began to say, all right, we're not going to look at these candidate SNPs anymore. Um, let's, let's look at uh, across the genome to do an unbiased search of the genome to see what genetic loci might actually contribute um, to brain structure across as many cohorts as are willing to join. And um, the reason uh, that there is such an interest in genetics is because there's a direct link uh, to the most basic biological mechanism. And that might mean um, like good uh, avenues for, for treatment options, um, while also identifying the imaging biomarker that will allow you to monitor uh, treatment efficacy. Um, so, as I mentioned, that, uh, we were taking an unbiased approach, uh, as in we're not selecting any particular um, SNPs or genetic variants that we uh, think might be associated with the brain, but we're doing an unbiased search across all a million independent regions of um, uh, common regions of, of our DNA. Um, and that requires a correction um, 0.05 divided by a million. You have uh, five times 10 to the negative eighth for a single um, genome-wide association study. Um, and, uh, and as I mentioned, um, there's been, for most common traits uh, and um, variation in, in certain brain structures is considered a common trait uh, or common and complex trait. Uh, you have these common variants that explain less than 1% of the variants. And it's, it's not different with, with brain volume. And um, a lot of the geneticists that we work with, uh, you know, we would go into, initially brain uh, imagers would go into genetics thinking, oh, this is such a fancy tool. Imaging is great. Um, it's exp so it's super expensive, so it must be good. But just because the measures were more expensive to collect, I, it actually didn't mean that it was more powerful and still each variant explains about one le or less than 1% of the, of the overall variance of the trait. Um, and recent work in um, the UK Biobank, maybe you're familiar with that resource, um, uh, looked at uh, um, power and sample size and the number of tests and essentially the sample sizes you'll need um, for, uh, for a given trait that might explain a certain percent of the variance. Um, and, and they made this nice plot. Uh, so oh, this got moved a little bit, but this is, oops, uh, the brain is supposed to be up here. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, there's a very small percent of, of variance explained with each individual SNP. If you're doing a GWAS, you have uh, about a, a million independent um, tests that you're running. Um, and so with brain imaging traits, <laughs> the brain uh, dropped down a little bit, but it's supposed to be right around here. So you need at least uh, 10,000 samples to do a well-powered genome-wide association study. Um, so, so how do we actually go about getting all this data? How do we get the sample size of 10,000 by using all the existing data sets that are, are, are smaller? And um, we were trying to retrospectively pool all this. So um, you're all familiar with the variation that you get when you scan across different, different scanners. Um, so this is an example of the same person scanned at uh, a 1.5 Tesla scanner um, that was being uh, shut down and replaced with a three Tesla scanner. And you could see uh, clear uh, differences in, in the contrast profile. You see like the, even the inhomogeneities are different. Um, cortical thickness variation looks different. Um, and, and we know that that is 
is is is the variability across scanners, and you can't uh, expect to scan everyone at a single scanner um, to come up with uh, a particular diagnosis. For example, it doesn't make sense to only be able to diagnose someone if they're scanned at a certain scanner and you want to extract some uh, measure. So it, our, our first um, approach in how to pull all this data was an analytical harmonization that uh, essentially, um, oh, that got cut off. Um, but uh, who all the groups that wanted to participate, um, they were all from different sites and different scanners. Uh, and, and we thought, okay, well, we're going to try and embrace that variability. We don't want that, our, whatever finding that we're going to have, we don't want it dependent on a particular scanner. So even if um, we're working with groups in parts of the world that might have uh, much older scanners, we still want to be able to use that data and, and um, have that mean something in the overall uh, analysis. So, so that's why uh, we started by harmonizing the analysis plan. And that is, let's all extract the same measures. Um, let's all do very similar uh, quality checks, quality assurance, and let's have the same statistical workflow. And this works exceptionally well for meta-analysis. Um, and, um, and what I mean by that is um, we're running the, the analysis separately at each of the specific locations. And then we pull the results, um, uh, the statistical results uh, across the sites uh, and do the, the final meta-analysis on, on um, pooled results. So, um, before we distribute the protocols, uh, we want to first assess whether the measures that we're going to extract are reliable. Um, and not only are they reliable once, but are they reliably reliable? So do we get uh, consistently reliable um, extractions across different types of scanners? Um, uh, so um, let's say that we want to extract hippocampal volume. Uh, if we run a free surfer on a 1.5 Tesla scanner, um, and we do that twice or a couple times within a same set of subjects, uh, do we roughly get the same uh, volume? Um, and then if we do that again on a three Tesla scanner somewhere else, do we also roughly get the same volume across uh, every time we scan the same participants? So we want to make sure that the measures we're extracting are um, reliable across uh, studies. Um, and then we want to make sure the protocols that we send out are well written. So we do ask uh, several sites to beta test them um, and help troubleshoot any issues that occur. And any common issues we'll um, try and fix and then um, make sure that there are quality uh, assurance measures in place so everyone knows whether the protocols worked successfully in, in their scans. Uh, and and the, that's um, once we check all that, that's when we send out the protocols. So in this example, um, this is uh, free surfer uh, cortical regions that were extracted. We did, um, we checked for reliability by testing the intraclass correlation across four different sites and found that most of the extracted regions are are, have high correlation, so high ICC, means they're fairly reliable. We developed some um, quality control protocols that says, okay, these are some common issues to be aware of. Um, you might want to note whether um, free surfer misses the cortex in any particular region, and then you would mark that as a fail. So um, with these clear instructions on, on what to look for, um, we're getting uh, past the, the fact that the, the data wasn't all collected the same, um, but they are analyzed the same. So we have several um, imaging protocols on the Enigma website. Um, I have to admit, this is a pretty old website, and we are trying to update all this and put, put all the um, protocols nicely on, on GitHub for, so it would be easier to follow. Um, but they do exist and they've been there for some time. 
Um, Nada, can I, can I actually ask you a question? Just wondering, are there some regions that you see consistently problem areas across uh, to harmonize? And what are those areas? And what are some really uh, consistent areas that seem to be pretty reliable? So that's, that's an excellent question. And I'm really glad you asked that. So uh, almost always we see the frontal and temporal poles are, are unreliable when we extract them from FreeSurfer. Um, they're not very well uh, extracted sometimes. There's a lot of artifacts um, around those areas. Uh, so you do see that quite a bit. Um, and uh, and that, that is something to be aware of. Um, also, we've noticed, uh, at least in this version of FreeSurfer that we uh, were running, this was an older version, so it was 5.3. Um, surface area is a lot more reliable than thickness itself. Uh, so, um, and I'll get to it in a bit, but we actually analyzed surface area and thickness separately and not volume. Um, but, but there are uh, definitely different degrees of reliability across all these measures that we've, we've been looking at. Um, Great, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, let me know if you have other questions too. There, there's more on the DTI um, reliability aspect, but I won't get into that. Um, but we recently, uh, um, one of our collaborators uh, in, in, in Germany has been putting together a fMRI pipeline. Um, and this was, uh, this is brand new. Um, it's based on, um, some of you might be familiar with, uh, uh, I, for, I forgot the name. Um, fMRI prep, sorry. Uh, so this is based on fMRI prep, but doesn't re necessarily require your data to be in bids format um, and does a lot of the uh, feature extraction that um, fMRI prep does not do, but follows a very similar um, pipeline uh, such that it um, is consistent with some of the, the best protocols that uh, and most up-to-date protocols that exist. Um, so going back to the free surfer analysis, I want to give um, one of the latest examples of how we uh, use the date or how, how we um, approach this. Uh, so we, um, uh, we recently published this study that looked at the genetic architecture of the, of the, the cortex, the human cortex. Um, and we looked at variants that were associated with uh, both global and regional uh, surface area and thickness. Um, so just the standard free surfer, uh, Desikin Kiliani Atlas. Um, and uh, we looked bilaterally to, um, to make sure we were, we were powered because if we looked uh, at left and right separately, then you double the number of tests that you're running. So right now we didn't have any hypothesis that there would necessarily be too much um, lateralized genetic effects. So at each site, in order to do this, we had, um, most groups were very familiar with running free surfers. That wasn't much of an issue. When it came to quality control, that was a, a little more of a, um, that was a little bit more time consuming, but we did ask that groups go through um, our quality control protocols, look for specific areas that might not be uh, well extracted and remove them from, from any uh, statistics that we were running. Uh, and and uh, we sent out some of the um, statistical protocols. And um, then at each site, you have uh, the results for that. So. Um, once the sites had all the genetic uh, results, um, they sent them over to the central server and we ran the meta-analysis and did some additional quality control on top of that. And, um, um, and basically we found that we had over 200 loci that were significant uh, after replicating in an independent sample. Um, and they were uh, well distributed throughout the genome. And also, most of them were actually unique to a particular brain region or trait. Uh, so to illustrate that, this is the uh, Miami plot 
for uh, global surface area. So um, what you're seeing here for, uh, for those of you less familiar with um, uh, these Manhattan plots, each dot represents a particular genetic variant um, on each sort of different colored blue chunk here represents a different chromosome. So each of the, the dots are in a particular chromosome. Um, the y-axis is negative log 10 of the p-value. So the more significant it is, the higher you, you see it on the scale. Uh, so this top portion it represents the results for surface area. Uh, and sort of the mirrored version of that sort of flipped on, on the x-axis um, is the global thickness. So um, you see there are some regions that are significant for both surface area and thickness, but then there are several that um, are unique to a particular trait. And when you look at this in aggregate, you actually notice that uh, um, there's a different genetic architecture in surface area than there is thickness. So when we're uh, looking to um, run some correlations against uh, existing data, we looked at um, this uh, partial heritability enrichment in, in different regulatory elements and different tissues. And uh, for surface area, we see the enrichment in fetal brain compared to uh, adult cortex. And in um, thickness, we see it the other way around where the enrichment was higher in um, adult cortex than, than uh, fetal. Um, we also see that just the number of hits, the polygenicity of the regions uh, varied across the brain. There, there were a lot more genetic hits in the occipital region. Uh, and again, a lot more in surface area than in thickness. And again, you can use these results and they're available to, for download if you want to um, use the, the final um, GWAS results in, in, any, in any study. We did some correlations uh, with other existing um, GWAS results and found that um, likely because uh, we didn't have results with thickness, um, there was no genetic correlation between uh, thickness measures and uh, any of these um, neuropsychiatric and neurobiological traits. Um, but we did see a positive genetic association with uh, uh, educational attainment, uh, cognitive function, and even Parkinson's degree. So uh, the genetics involved in uh, um, sort of increasing surface area are also uh, increased risk for, for Parkinson's disease. So that um, was an interesting finding. And then the association is negative for a lot of other traits that you might expect, such as um, major depression, insomnia, ADHD. So I talked about genetics a little bit, but um, Enigma is, has grown far beyond that. And uh, we want to look and ensure reliability um, across a lot of neuroimaging sciences, so not just genetics. Uh, um, so this is the current Enigma, um, I guess, structure or architecture. There are um, working groups dedicated to developing algorithms with particular modalities um, or, or looking at certain methods such as brain age. Um, and there are several um, both clinical and non-clinical groups focused on a particular neurobiological aspect. Um, the TBI consor working group is essentially a consortium in its own and has several subgroups. Um, there are a uh, lot of psychiatric disorder working groups, but also groups looking at um, aging and, and um, plasticity, or uh, this group is focused on um, a longitudinal uh, mapping if there are uh, groups that have more than one um, time point in their imaging. So there's a lot going on um, and it gets pretty hard to keep track of, but uh, one, one benefit of having all this under the same framework uh, is that you're able to run these harmonized analyses plans across these different um, specific focus groups and then look at the effects uh, uh, across these groups and make um, 
and make some comparisons. So what you're seeing here is um, uh, the effect size um, of each of each of these specific regions with each of these particular disorders. Uh, so, um, and all on the same scale. So following these harmonized analysis methods allows you to make these comparisons. Uh, and, and not only that, our, um, all our workflows and, and um, protocols are all public. So uh, other consortia have actually um, used the same methodology and done very similar things in, a, in an independent population completely. And this, this, was, um, this was exciting to me when we published a, uh, a DTI study of schizophrenia um, not too long after that. Uh, at, Schizophrenia Consortium in Japan followed the same protocols and um, basically their findings were very similar to, to ours. So that was exciting. So um, there's a, a lot of ongoing initiatives. I only touched upon uh, a couple of the studies that we've done recently, um, but there's a, a lot more ways that the consortium is expanding and uh, my group focuses quite a bit on the, um, the image analysis and also the informatics aspect of all this. So I'll be covering just a couple things that we do uh, in, in my group. Um, one, uh, uh, one of the, the kind of newer areas that we're looking into is this um, method for keeping track of continuous analyses. Uh, so let's say, um, and I know this is a very busy slide, um, but there's just you know, a couple takeaway messages from here. So let's say you have an analysis that's, that's been run. So our, let's say our Enigma uh, cortical GWAS that I presented um, is published. And then there's uh, an, a few other sites with data that um, want to see how their data might uh, compare to the results and how our results might change if they had contributed to the work. Um, so we're working with, um, uh, with, with folks here at the uh, uh, Information Sciences Institute to develop this framework where our uh, results for the different studies are, are embedded in here and you can, um, add additional data points and see how your findings might evolve over time. Um, because it, it doesn't necessarily make sense to publish in, again after maybe adding, let's say, 500 more participants to a particular study. But this will allow you to kind of keep, keep it going. Uh, and if results change over time, or if you find uh, associations with um, some uh, some property of the cohorts, uh, then, then that might be interesting. So um, for example, um, here you can see uh, we had demonstrated this, this continuous workflow by removing one of our data points. Our biggest data point was the UK Biobank. Um, and we show how our forest plots uh, and um, uh, a meta regression with age might change uh, after you add a certain sample. So, um, so this framework also allows you to look at, as I mentioned, the metadata for the cohort. So let's say average age, um, perhaps you know, the scanners that they were collected at uh, and see if there is a pattern with any particular variable. Um, so let's say you know, 1.5 T showed no effect, but 3 T showed some effect. So you would be able to see that in this meta um, data framework. Um, and I, while Enigma started as a, a meta-analysis, um, there are reasons why you would, uh, sorry, the slide is out of order. So Enigma started as a meta-analysis, and as I mentioned, this is, this is essentially um, all the sites running the same protocols with their local data, and the results are merged. Uh, and that allows, that has a lot of advantages. You don't have to deal with um, data transfer agreements for anyone who's done that, that's not fun. Uh, and um, the, there's, there's no problem with 
you know, sending data over, there's no privacy issues, but it does require good distribution of effects at each site. So uh, if you were doing um, a patient control analysis, uh, you wouldn't be able to do it at a site that didn't have controls because you would need that distribution in order to run that statistical model. So if you have rare traits, um, a meta-analysis is not ideal because you'd only have you know, one or two people at every site um, and then your statistics are not uh, are still not going to be well powered when you have when you combine them. So uh, alternatively, you can perform a mega analysis, and that's when all the data at the individual subject level are pooled together, and then uh, and then the uh, stats or analysis is run. Um, so that's essentially what you have when you um, work. With ADME, for example, you have all the data from the different sites, uh, you, you have it all in one location, and then you run your, your analysis. Um, but that does, as I mentioned, require data sharing. Uh, it is problematic for a lot of sites in, um, in Europe in particular right now um, because they have the GDPR. Um, but, but it does have a lot of benefits for sites that are able to share their data um, and uh, you, you are able to pool rare effects uh, and perform better powered studies. Um, however, this, this often needs uh, some slightly more advanced statistical models and it helps to harmonize the data beforehand. So um, this is an example of um, what we can do with the mega analysis approach. So going beyond meta um, this was uh, the analysis that was run as part of the epilepsy working group. Um, they were looking at uh, DTI extracted traits. Um, it was run by Sean Hatton. In, it was published in Brain just last year. Um, he not only looked at uh, epilepsy versus control, um, but by pooling all the data into one location, you could really look at the subgroups. So um, like left temporal lobe uh, epilepsy with hippo hippocampal sclerosis, um, right, or, or non-lesional. So you're able to break apart um, the, the uh, diagnostics into smaller uh, subsets and, and, and um, perhaps do some biotyping uh, with specific features. Uh, and you have the power when you uh, are able to pull all the data across sites because uh, some of the, the rarer um, uh, diagnoses are not necessarily going to be well represented at every single site, um, which limits the ability to perform meta-analysis with the T. Um, and in this case, we, we did do uh, a harmonization method called COMBAT. Um, which uh, essentially does some uh, uh, normalization of the, uh, um, of the first order or second order statistics of each of the sites. So you have well distributed um, measures um, after correction than you did before. Uh, and this allows you to better do the mega analysis. Um, Similarly, in Parkinson's disease, uh, this is uh, unpublished work, it's on bio or med archive. Um, in addition to looking at all uh, Parkinson's patients versus all of the controls, uh, we were able to pull um, data from individuals who were uh, scanned at different stages or uh, hone and yar stages of, of Parkinson's. Um, and look at um, the effects across stages. And you can clearly see uh, these are all on the same scale. You can see the uh, effects of certain regions um, becoming more pronounced in the, uh, in the later stages of the disease. So uh, the, the methods um, for harmonization often requires some statistical harmonization, um, but there are new, uh, I guess, newer efforts working on um, deep learning based harmonization methods. And this is a postdoc in my group who is um, 
looking to essentially map the style of uh, particular uh, images to, um, to any other scanner. So let's say uh, you have um, an image from ADNI, you can uh, map the PPMI image and the UK Biobank image uh, to, um, to that same style. And by style, I mean uh, things like signal to noise ratio, the contrast, um, and not actually any of the specific anatomical properties. So one issue with um, some uh, deep learning paradigms is that if you're trying to harmonize across uh, or, or harmonization um, paradigms uh, more globally, if you're trying to harmonize um, between sites that not only differ in the scans that they were that were used or the scanners that were used, but also the population of um, participants that were scanned, uh, you might overcorrect. So you don't necessarily want to correct for biological differences, um, but just scanner related differences. So this method attempts to overcome that by just matching style uh, and not um, content or anatomy. So uh, this is um, in the works and hopefully we'll have some uh, good results soon. Um, uh, I can, I know I'm almost out of time, but I can make this pretty quick. So uh, other areas of interest, um, I think in this um, uh, sort of large scale consortia setting is to try and look for features that might be in a little bit more invariant to scanners um, and still have a biological effect than, um, than some of the others that we know are scanner dependent. Uh, so one of my PhD students, uh, Alyssa Zhu right now is looking at um, the curvature of the corpus callosum just in 2D mid sagittal view. And um, we're seeing that you could, uh, as you would expect, the curvature does not necessarily depend on the, the contrast um, of, of the scan and uh, across different scanners. Um, there really is not much of a, uh, a scanner effect on curvature. Um, so there is some, uh, some biological uh, effects um, that are related to curvature. So she is um, working on a tool that uh, will hopefully be made public soon. Um, another effort uh, led by Talia Nier, a postdoc in my group, is working with this tensor distribution function for a diffusion MRI that doesn't estimate just a single tensor uh, at a particular voxel, but um, estimates the possible distribution of tensors and calculates a FA across them all, um, and then integrates over that to have uh, an FA defined from um, the TDF or tensor distribution function. And we found that seems to be um, surprisingly actually uh, less, um, less dependent on scanner than FA itself. Um, so all that, all, these, all this harmonization and all this pooling of data really allows for, um, as I mentioned, looking at effects that you nece couldn't necessarily do before. Um, a lot of these rare traits um, so we have this, uh, this new initiative that looks across um, diagnoses and is really doing like a transdiagnostic approach to uh, suicidal thoughts and behaviors, um, and uh, which uh, suicide is obviously uh, a, a, a big problem and a growing problem in the US. And uh, however, Scanning individuals that might have had a suicide attempt is is still is a uh, is is rare. So being able to really um, make use of this this uh, enigma mechanism and pull from from a lot of existing resources allows us to have um, uh, quite decent sample sizes. So um, so we are comparing in this group. Uh, uh, suicide attempters, not just at healthy controls, but also clinical controls. 
um, that um, might have a particular neuropsychiatric diagnosis, but not have any history of suicidal attempt or ideation. Um, and this is just some preliminary uh, information on our sample sizes thus far. Um, and some preliminary results show that, uh, um, interestingly enough, with um, cortical thickness, we don't really see any difference between uh, ideators and, um, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, um, the difference between uh, uh, um, uh, ideators and, uh, and healthy controls is actually driven um, by the diagnosis and not the suicidal ideation. And, and that's how we, uh, why we're using the clinical controls to determine that. Um, however, there, there does seem to be some effect in attempters with, um, with surface area that is not explained um, by the clinical diagnoses. Uh, so this is, again, preliminary results. We're, we're still expanding this working group. Um, but but uh, as just an example of you know, what we can can do by uh, by pooling a lot of this data and hopefully being able to uh, do more advanced harmonization um, and more statistical uh, approaches, we'll be able to uh, make greater discoveries. So um, basically, in summary, we're trying to enhance uh, power in, in these neuroimaging studies, um, hopefully promoting some computational efficiency through the distributed network. Uh, of course, um, we're big uh, supporters of open science and reproducibility and team science and working together. Um, a lot of the work I mentioned is um, led by people around the world um, and uh, often just something I play a small role in. Uh, and I think this, this is a sort of good framework because anyone who's interested in leading something and is contributing to Enigma has the uh, ability to do so and, and the resources. Um, and yeah, in, in conclusion, we're just hoping to advance uh, neuroscientific discovery. Um, so I'm not gonna read every single name here, but there are tens of thousands of participants that have uh, enrolled in some participating Enigma working group somewhere in the world. Um, and you know, without uh, everyone um, signing up for being a research participant, we wouldn't have the data. Uh, and there are um, a lot of researchers that have been involved in every aspect of this work. So um, thank you for, for having me. And uh, if you have any more questions, happy to take them. Thank you. That was a great talk, Nada. Um, I would like to invite any students to start us off with any questions they might have. I guess I just have like a, a very practical question. How do people get involved with the Enigma Consortium if they want to? Like, do they apply or is it open to anyone with data or how does that work? Yeah, it's, it's generally open to anyone with data who wants to join. Um, we have, as I mentioned, a lot of working groups. Um, a lot of them are in different stages of analysis. And uh, if um, you're interested in joining and if you have data, we can set you up with the leader of a particular working group and you can see what projects that group is focusing on at the moment. Um, most of them are, are not doing you know, case control work anymore, but are looking at more specific um, symptoms or features or, or, or profiles of, of patients and comparing them. So there's a lot going on. So if you have a specific idea of something you want to do, there, there are ways to get involved. I think you can just enigma or email enigma at ini.usc.edu and we'll, 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 we'll know how to connect you. That seems great. Um, so I have, a, I have a question about, um, I, you know, I, I think this work is, is monumental and it's definitely going to help the field as a whole move forward. Um, I am wondering though about whether or not this um, this method allows us to sort of get closer to a ground truth or how, you know, how do we compare um, 
higher res, newer acquisition, you know, like 32 channel, 64 channel head coils with, you know, stuff done in the late or mid 2000s where uh, they didn't really, you know, they had like an eight channel head coil and they acquired like a two millimeter ISO MP rage. Are we sort of blurring the, the boundaries of, you know, brain areas or cortical thickness and surface area, or are we, you know, is there, is there a way to sort of account for that and to, to move us forward? I, th I think that's a great question and, and really something that we are um, looking to address. We're trying to find the, the answer to your question. Exactly. So uh, I, uh, especially, I do a lot of work in diffusion imaging as well. So we've seen that shift in diffusion quite a lot from going from you know, 12 directions to 64 directions. And now everything is multi-shell and has like the APPA data collection. So there's so much that uh, more advanced work than that you could do now that you weren't even able to do like two, three years ago. Um, so the, the sample sizes in the more advanced uh, acquisitions are slowly growing. And I think with time, we'll be able to uh, either use the older acquisitions to sort of pinpoint more regions that we're interested in or like tracks or parts of the brain that could really benefit from that higher resolution. Um, or eventually we might be able to uh, use some of the statistical methods to really weigh heavily on the better acquisitions. And um, to some extent, the, um, the meta-analysis where we're currently, um, the way we're doing it is uh, you weight each site by the inverse of the variance. So if um, it has lower variability. It weighs it weighs more on the uh, on the overall outcome. Um, but yeah, I, th I think that's a great question. Hopefully, we'll be able to see uh, <laughs> how much additional power these these new uh, acquisition methods are really buying us. How much um, better resolution we're, we're getting. Um, I'm very interested in that. <laughs> I have a question um, with this replica replication crisis. Is there any concerted effort to like use undergrads or grad students to like re replicate experiments and like train them? I mean, that seems like the obvious choice, and maybe everybody's already doing that. I just don't know that. Sorry, can you can you repeat the <clears throat> question? Yeah, replication crisis. Uh, do do they just use grad students and undergrad students just to repeat experiments to learn them? You know. I mean, is that is that something that people do? It seems like it's an obvious choice, like that. That I just maybe I don't know about it. You know? That's a that's a good point. So there are many ways to try and replicate a study. You could um, try and replicate the exact same study uh, from scratch. Um, I think generally the replication crisis uh, that has been um, found to be much more problematic is when a result doesn't replicate in any other cohort. So you find this, this really like earth shattering result, but it's only in a very specific sample. You know, they have to have been collected uh, on a single scanner. Everything must have been done a single way um, and no other population can rep. So there, there are a lot of ways in which uh, replication is an issue. The one you described is, is, is one for sure um, and then a branching out to other populations is another. So yeah, that's a really good question. So are, are grad students and undergrads used to replicate experiments in, in like an organized way or not? Not that I know of. I think some grad students and undergrads have certainly tried to replicate certain papers, but I don't think on um, a large scale, I haven't seen that, no. Yeah. Like, Yeah, so Netta, I have a question about the genetics um, and variants. So you're looking at brain structure as well as a phenotype. Do you think that the um, with the enigma, are you are we able to explain more of the variants now with um, you know with brain as an endophenotype or with you know, the disease outcomes. So we talked, you talked about candidate genes and how they explain so little of the variance. Do you see that the, the newer methods 
that you're involved in are explaining more of the variance. And that question also pertains to the idea of how much does generic uh, genetic variants explain a phenotype and to what extent does like gene expression and, and other things that could impact how genes actually work on the brain, how much of a story does that have in the big picture? So that's a good question. The, um, we've actually found uh, the, uh, the variants of the genes that we're finding or the genetic variants that we're finding are, are really small. So they're even less than 1%. Uh, and to some extent, that is because we're looking at common, um, common variants. With larger and larger sample sizes, if, you know, if we're able to pull data from multiple biobanks, um, then I think we can look into some of the rare variants that are thought to have much higher penetrance and uh, have larger effects. Um, but when we're looking at basically normally distributed populations and um, fairly common variants, you wouldn't necessarily expect them to have um, huge effects. Otherwise, we would see, uh, you know, a good percentage of the people walking around that have, you know, like the smaller head sizes. But there is some. We're just looking in that normal variation right now. Um, sorry, I forgot the second part of your question. <laughs> about what your thoughts are about gene expression. Also, you know, is it? Do you think it's um, a similar, can explain a similar amount or more of the variance of a phenotype potentially? The gene expression itself is likely able to explain a lot more. Um, it's just getting that data um, right now is, is not uh, you know, feasible in, in living humans and you need like um, actually to extract brain tissue to be able to look at the uh, expression profile. but. Um, but there are now resources like the Allen, Allen Brain Institute that have made some data available. So I think that's a great resource and we're, um, you know, it's nice to be able to look at the ver single variant effects and see how they might line up with uh, expression profiles. Um, it's just, uh, I don't know too much about that and the, I know just the, there's much less data out there um, right now. How do you choose the genes that you think will show up in a MRI scan? Uh, because like a lot of them are invisible, they're you know, molecular, but what, what would you look for that would have an effect like in a gross scale, you know? Yeah, so, um, so at the like DNA level, like the variant level, like, like I mentioned, we don't really know that. So we just searched across everything. Um, but there are like genes and pathways that are known to have certain effects and not from human studies necessarily, but like, um, uh, you know, mice and, and, um, uh, and other model uh, organisms. Um, and you can, you see, for example, wind signaling pathways are involved in, in uh, development. And um, in our cortical uh, GWAS, we saw that a lot of the variants that we found were significant in, in terms of associating with surface area were in this um, uh, wind um, signaling pathway. So um, there are ways to sort of link the two, but right now, um, yeah, the, the work we're, not, we're, we're doing doesn't uh, necessarily give us information on, um, on gene expression in, in the brain. So that, that's, you know, we're just trying to pair that up with other existing resources to explain our findings too. Okay. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you so much again, Nada. Um, this is a wonderful talk. And uh, if people have additional questions, you can um, email uh, Nada over here. Um, again, thank you. And I hope everyone has a great weekend. Yeah, thanks everyone. Happy Friday.